due to the graphic program. Made possible by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. When computer hackers disrupted Microsoft's websites for two days in a row in January, Microsoft called in the FBI to investigate. Tonight, how they invade our computers. Hackers are a force to be reckoned Or have they shown us just how vulnerable we really are? Auction site eBay was not... We are at war. We don't know who we're at war with yet. Are hackers the problem, or could they be the solution? They are seeing the dangers, they are seeing the vulnerabilities, and everyone wants to shoot the messenger. Easy it would be to get into a computer. Tonight, frontline correspondent Lyndon McIntyre investigates hackers. Last time I had a visit from burglars, they broke down a door. This time all it took was an email, one of billions that flashed through homes and offices like mine each day. This one put a bug in my computer. It could have caused a disaster. Miles away, a former policeman had agreed to demonstrate an elementary and quite illegal hacking technique. At the other end, now they've got a little box there that says, uh, we own your system. And do you? Yes. yes. My computer? You own my computer? That's what? right. Now, uh, if you're a bad guy, what are you going to do with it? I'm going to go and have a look at what you have in your file system here. Really? Yeah. Rennie Hamill works for the accounting firm KPMG, breaking into clients' computers to reveal their weaknesses. The work is depressingly I easy. See? Look at this. Here you go. So here's your, uh, here's your document. <laughs> and I can modify it. The uh, hijack, uh, it's a plugin basically that enables me to uh, take over uh, your mouse and the keyboard. See that little red dot there? Yeah. OK, let's move in the uh, cursor on your screen right now. An invisible intruder in an empty room explores an appliance as sensitive as a filing cabinet, as private as a diary, using technology available to anybody. Now, how uh, sophisticated is the software or, or the, the whatever you've done here? I mean, or this is a free software in the net that uh... free software. Hackers are nothing if not generous. In fact, anybody can become a hacker just by visiting their websites and downloading available versions of a device called a Trojan horse, like Back Orifice, then load it into a greeting card or a popular computer game, like the one he sent to me by email. And, and, and it's a fun program. Yeah, a little and, game I can and play. And while you're doing this, the virus is uh, getting installed in the background, and you're infected. Hacking often looks and sounds like mischief, but for Daniel Seberg, a hacking incident had the psychological impact of a physical assault. I was uh, working on an essay for a school, a graduate essay about women on the, on the internet. So I poured myself some wine and I sat down at the computer and I was basically doing some research and, and surfing through a number of sites to check this out. They included porn sites, the most controversial and popular destinations on the internet. As he watched, he didn't know that he was being watched by a cyber vigilante who decided to express his disapproval. The words just started typing in and said, uh, I can see what you're doing. I just thought it was either a really clever advertisement or an another program that I'd accidentally downloaded from a site or something that had popped up. It really didn't hit me until I saw my Windows password come up in the chat box. At that point, I started to panic. I just wanted him out of there. He was a victim of that outlaw program, Back Orifice, a few lines of program code created by a group that includes these two elite hackers. 
And in fact, you have more control over that machine than the person sitting at the keyboard um, because we expose more power through the back orifice tool than the Windows 98 desktop does. So much power that it made Daniel Seberg's computer speak to him. This is the actual message left in his system. G'day. I'm a friendly hacker. I live in Australia. Doesn't it frighten the shit out of you that I can get into your computer and send you a sound wave like this? So you don't have to worry. I won't do anything wrong. But you better be a good boy or a good girl and not look at any dirty pictures. Because if you do, I'll know what you're doing and I can see it too. I'll catch up with you again. Have a nice day. Bye. At the time, I had an antivirus. I had Norton antivirus running and he disabled that. Um, and he was nice enough to tell me, I've disabled Norton Antivirus. You're going to have to get another version <laughs> and upgrade it. Um, in a sense, he was scolding me for you know, having these outdated programs. I was not diligent enough to keep updating my you know, firewalls and security programs. And people think they have this sense of comfort and security when they're online. And it just totally blew that out of the water for me. The internet itself, um, you know, it was constructed with this idea that we were all going to be nice to each other. And uh, all of the standards and all the protocols assume, basically, that no one is going to lie or cheat or steal. A lawyer named Mary Frank created this website after somebody stole her identity, a crime that now affects more than half a million Americans a year. I got a phone call from a bank that I'd never heard of. And I said, is this Mari Frank? And I said, yes. And the woman said, well, this is the Bank of New York and Delaware, and we want to know why you haven't paid your $11,000 bill to us. And I said, I'm sorry, I'm running out now. You have the wrong name, the wrong number. I don't know who you are. I got to go. And the woman said, wait a minute. Is this your social security number and your birth date? And of course, then by that time, I started to get worried, and I said, what are, you, what are you looking at? She said, well, I'm, I'm looking at your credit report. The thief was caught and sent to jail, but that wasn't the end of Mary's troubles. I found there was over $50,000 worth of credit that was stolen in my name. This woman had purchased a red convertible Mustang in my name as well. She had gotten credit cards so she could rent a car, total it, and I was being sued by Thrifty Rental Car. <laughs> It's hard to imagine that anybody really foresaw how easy it would be to get into a computer or how once inside it becomes virtually possible to reach out and touch just about anything in the world. The flip side, of course, is that anybody in the world can reach back into your life through a computer that comes with tens of thousands of open access points, a machine connected to hundreds of millions of other machines or how when we leave the machine running, as we are more and more inclined to do, we increasingly expose ourselves to global snooping. In the global village, personal privacy has become the privacy of a medieval hamlet where everybody potentially knows everything about everybody else. Not surprisingly, computer security experts are in big demand now. Kirk Bailey works for the Frank Russell Company, managers of $63 billion in clients' assets. In his personal life, he avoids the Internet like a plague zone. I don't participate or have connectivity in the Internet at home. Uh, it's just uh, something I've chosen not to do. If he ever needed proof of his personal vulnerability, he got it when he challenged some fellow security experts to build a file on him, starting from Internet sources available online they were able to gather the elements of a virtual identity. What sort of stuff did they find out about you? Uh, it was a remarkable cache of, of information. Uh, real quickly, uh, the most damaging document was a certified copy of my birth certificate. This is a, a legal document that can be used for the uh, uh, purposes of identifying myself. A complete copy of my college transcripts with the embossed seal from the university. Um, from online, they gathered a complete listing of online court documents that are related to me, everything from my dissolution of marriage documents to a uh, failed business that was, uh, that was out there, information there. I think the average citizen would be amazed at the uh, thin veneer of control that really exists for their privacy. Global Crossing. It's what happens when the most robust...
robust global network needs the richest content to take your business anywhere on the planet. The engines of mass media and all the vendor marketing people have created this enormous impression on the general public that, that this is a necessity for you to be successful. It's a way to become rich. It's the way to become educated. Your whole future is based on it. There's this whole sense of anxiety about not being there and, and the pleasures of being there. The untold story is a bigger story, and that is this technology cannot be secured. Uh, and that's a fact. Just charting the connections between security and cybercrime has become a full-time job for specialists like Richard Power of the Computer Security Institute in San Francisco. He's written a book about recent computer crimes, including a raid on the giant Citibank. Nobody wants to talk about the Citibank case much because it, the bankers don't want you to think about problems with online banking and the um, internet, the dot-com companies don't want you to think about the consequences of cybercrime, but there it is. Whether the bankers like it or not, the Citibank case has made it into the Hackers Hall of Fame. And Vladimir Levin has entered hacker history as the first digital bank robber. Levin pulled off a $10 million heist without leaving his apartment in St. Petersburg, Russia. He used his computer and international telecommunications to raid Citibank accounts around the world. Early on in the evolution of things, this wasn't even an internet crime. This was just a dial-in. You, you called up with your telephone and you made uh, transactions uh, from your, to and from your account. Uh, and these systems were compromised early on, before the Internet. That kind of activity on the Internet, I suggest, is even easier, not, not harder. These are credit card numbers. Last year, thousands of them turned up on the website of a hacker named Curador. They were clearly stolen, but it seemed the thief wasn't using them, just showing them off. A little hacker humor. But it wasn't funny here at the FBI's National Infrastructure Protection Center in Washington. They soon wanted to know badly who Curador was. Curador was someone who was able to uh, hack into systems and, and steal, uh, I believe, in the vicinity of 26,000 credit card numbers. Uh, that's a significant uh, crime there, obviously, and he did it uh, in many different countries. <laughs> Curador was casting a shadow over the credibility of e-commerce and threatening the survival of a lot of companies, including a little firm in Buffalo, New York, called Salesgate, owner Chris Keller. My initial reaction was like, oh, that's ridiculous. It's completely impossible. You know, we had, we had things set up and things in place so that that kind of thing would never happen. But it did happen. We checked our server logs and found that we did have an incident that had gone undiscovered. So we immediately started searching the net for this particular individual. And with the help of a security team in Canada, we actually uncovered one of his websites. Chris Davis was actually a security consultant and ex-hacker from Ottawa, Canada, who'd started tracking the cocky curador independently. He just thought very, very highly of what it was that he was doing. And uh, really, in the sort of the hacker community, he's considered, you know, sort of absolutely no skill kind of stuff. I mean, it's uh, what we term as script kitty stuff, which means that you know, you just download an application off the internet and, and you run that application, it does everything for you. Curador was openly bragging about his achievement to anybody who wanted to listen. Welcome to Internet News Radio. I'm Brian. One of the people listening was Chris Davies, thanks to the internet. Curador said he likes to compare himself to the main character in the movie, The Saint. Basically, it's my delusions of grandeur coming into full view. You, you've got potentially several law enforcement agencies in several countries tracking you. Yeah, it doesn't concern me at all. They can pack the wet paper bag law enforcement. But Davis tracked him, following electronic footprints around the world without leaving his computer terminal. And he caught him and notified the FBI. You know, the bragging got to me. I just wanted to say, okay, look, you're really not this good. You're not as good as you think you are. I know I'm, you know, guessing I have a really good idea how you're doing this. From looking at the log, I was able to trace back where, what internet service provider it was he was using in the UK.
UK headquarters for the villain Curador turned out to be a bedroom in rural Wales, littered with broken computers and new age books, pop cans and ashtrays, and a TV set where twice a day a bored teenager indulges an addiction to reruns of the 60s spy series The Saint. Curador is Raphael Gray, 18 years old. He's been getting a lot of visitors lately, ever since Chris Davies blew his cover. It's your first trip back here. Oh, yeah, this is uh, fascinating. Driving on the wrong side of the road. <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm fascinated. Well, we there we are, Clender, Clenderwin. 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 Yeah. yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Davies, the ex-hacker, was yeah. keen to meet him. Mr. Rowe? Yeah. He's remarkably friendly, considering that just weeks earlier he'd opened his door to be swarmed by a squad of police officers and an FBI agent. And all in all, there was like ten of us in this room, all crowded round, but there was less sport sport space in here than there is now, a lot less. Mm -hmm. So they're all crammed in here. Four of them were um, plain clothes, and there was one guy wearing a sort of grey trench coat, looking very dishevelled, and shaven, and he could seriously look like he had some jet lag. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, I, I'm I, guessing that's FBI, yeah? Yeah, that, yeah. Uh, that, that was confirmed later on. He wouldn't admit it to begin with. He claimed to be a Welsh police officer with a strong accent. <laughs> <laughs> they carted Curador off to the nearby town of Tenby, charged him with computer crimes. His case is currently in the courts. Raphael sees himself as a fairly typical hacker, not so much a crook as a nuisance. I think, obviously, I'm just a very nosy person. I, I, I'm like your nosy neighbor on steroids, basically. <laughs> they are explorers, tirelessly traveling, fueled on caffeine, looking in cyber windows, trying cyber doorknobs, because they're bored or just because they can. There is a lot of adrenaline, if nothing else, while you're trying to track it down. I sometimes will spend two days solidly trying to do something without sleep, without anything, just constantly trying to do it. And when you finally get through, the relief is not just from the fact you've got in, but now you can sleep. Your body is just literally crying out in relief from every possible avenue. Bored boys once threw stones at empty warehouse windows, spray-painted public monuments. Now they're in cyberspace, making public mischief that they claim serves useful public purposes. You, you didn't break in there just to... Uh show the world how stupid and sloppy these people were? But, but what were you really up to? The whole point of it was the message. And the message was? That there are a lot of people out there who uh, won't even safeguard their own safety, let alone the safety of their customers, you know? They're thumbing their noses at technology, some say just to get attention, and they are getting it from some of the most influential people in Washington who aren't buying the line about the social value of the pranks. It seems to me that thanking hackers who violate um, the, the privacy of networks or network users for pointing out to us our vulnerabilities is a little bit like sending thank you notes to burglars for pointing out the infirmity of our physical alarms. That's, that's silly. How do you credibly quantify mm -hmm. this problem that we're talking about, this vulnerability through the Internet? <laughs> It's big, it's deep, it's wide, it has many facets. And it now has structure, complete with conventions for the very unconventional. They are the newest counterculture, challenging the power of industry giants like Microsoft, with a language as impenetrable to outsiders as their sense of humor. <laughs> always just seemed like an obvious thing to me is when Windows machines start up, they send out a package which says, hey, I'd like to use this name. Is that okay with everybody? So one of the other things my program does is say, no. <laughs> but are they really delinquents? Their interests seem to be maturing from hardware and sophisticated program code to perhaps another kind of code. We have to create a network ethics that is institutionalized by law. Robert Steele used to work for the CIA. Now he's an information security specialist. 
and the hackers asked him to come and talk to them about a code of ethics. Why is ethics important? Ethics is about building for the common good. Ethics is about establishing due diligence standards so that when you buy a car, the bolts on the wheels are actually screwed on. Bill Gates is selling computers without wheels. They crash a lot. Food is regulated. Automobile safety is regulated. People need licenses to cut your hair. There are no licenses required to write software. There are no standards of documentation or testing or certification for software. So in essence, our entire digital society now is based on software built by people we don't know, who have no licenses, who have no quality control, who are not legally liable if their software causes the destruction of our business. That's scary. At Microsoft, the head of security disagrees. Howard Schmidt says that for the most part, software needs less regulation than other businesses. If, if I buy a cigarette lighter, it's going to have a little stamp on the bottom of it, you know, approved by you know, some regulatory standards setting agency, yet I can buy software that'll sort of control my life. And it doesn't have to have... Yeah, that, that's correct. And, and, and software obviously used for different reasons, whether you're sitting home, as, as I do with my son, and, and, and software is just installed to play some games. Uh, the level of security building that would be far different than when we need to run an enterprise or a business on. And those are the standards that we're looking at now and trying to come up with to identify what are the core processes in place that, that identify what security standards would be. I think there's little likelihood that the government's going to uh, mandate things. They have been very good about saying that we will stay out of the business things, let the market forces drive this, as long as it doesn't compromise national security and the economic structure of the country. But for people who live a large part of their lives on the Internet, regulation is essential for integrity. And they're committed to keeping companies like Microsoft publicly accountable for their products. These young people have a gift for finding holes in computer and communication systems. They have a gift for telling us that the emperor is naked and has no clothes. They clothe serious messages in the gaudy fabrics of their generation. But the point is clear. The software industry encourages a culture of convenience that is endangering personal privacy and public security. This group of hackers calls itself Cult of the Dead Cow. They created the Back Orifice program to illustrate that point. I think for us, the motivation for releasing Back Orifice was that um, Microsoft has the world's most popular operating system. It's installed on 90% of the computers in the world, or at least the desktop computers. And those people are being encouraged, urged, to take those computers and plug them into the internet. Uh, unfortunately, those people are wide open to attack of various kinds. Um, we thought we would be uh, serving the community best by demonstrating that we could easily write a tool that would take advantage of that and as an existence proof for the ability to do that. You think there's downtime now when your desktop computer crashes, just wait until the future if, if we don't get it right and your entire house crashes for a week and you can't talk, you can't communicate, you can't do anything. Ultimately, everything becomes computerized. You know, your refrigerator will tell your watch that you need milk. So when you're in the car and you drive by a store and a store has a sale on milk, it'll tell your watch, which will then speak to you and say, hey, why don't you go pick up some milk that's on sale there and you need it at home. And, and all of this will be part of a global conversation that happens in this digital world. And that's another reason why I'm just very, um, I'm very concerned that we make sure we get it right in terms of the security. Even Microsoft agrees up to a point the problem really lies in the public obsession with convenience, which makes security more difficult. Stephen Lipner is a senior security analyst for the company. In a prior job uh, for another company, I built what the U.S. government called an A1 system, a system that was as secure as the U.S. Defense Department knew how to make it. Okay, And we put... Uh, years and millions of dollars into doing that. Uh, and then the end of that development project, uh, I made the decision to cancel it.
because nobody wanted to buy it. Okay. Uh, the moral of the story being? The moral of the story being that usability, flexibility, security are a set of trade-offs. And uh, customers, customers don't want systems that are so secure that they can't use them. For all its mysteries, the computer is the ultimate in user friendliness. A Microsoft commercial celebrates the virtue of simplicity. Unfortunately, not all users are as virtuous as Microsoft would hope. And last year, when police rounded up the Filipino students suspected of having created the I Love You virus, they found there was no law to prosecute. For British parliamentarians faced with an I Love You headline to the Pentagon, White House, and FBI. Well, first of all, we do not love the love bug virus. The virus affected an estimated 45 million computer users and cost billions. It became a plague because of an inherent weakness in another Microsoft product. We take it for granted that you have to be afraid when, you're, when you get an attachment. You have to be afraid to figure out where it came from. I'm afraid to click on this. You know, is it worth it to open this spreadsheet where I might blow up my computer. I mean, if you got in your automobile and every day it would stall several times and there was no way to lock it, there was no way to lock your car, I mean, you would be really mad and furious at the car manufacturer for not putting locks in there. And so we are witnessing the emergence of a powerful dynamic. Hackers dedicated to discovering weaknesses in commercial systems, weaknesses that they discover with disconcerting ease and often illustrate with cyber mischief. Software manufacturers racing to keep up with the hackers and their discoveries, developing remedies that are revealingly called patches, making them available for easy application by their customers. We'd rather have fewer vulnerabilities, and, uh, and we're, we're making progress on that score through our development processes, through some of the tools that we apply during development. Uh, but when vulnerabilities are found, the, the test then for a vendor is what do you do about them? And we don't cover them up. We don't try to deny them. Uh, we acknowledge them. We fix them as fast as we can. But remember Curador? He got all those credit card numbers through a loophole in one of Microsoft's popular software products. Microsoft knew about the problem and went so far as to post a notice on their website offering a patch to fix it. But victim Chris Keller says that wasn't good enough. It's my feeling that Microsoft wasn't doing a good enough job of alerting its own customers to the fact that there was a flaw there. They claimed that they were trying to, um, but I don't think that they were doing it quite the way that a hacking incident could alert all major companies to something like this. Well, you're issuing patches, but the ordinary person is not hearing about them and certainly not applying them. That's a real concern for us. And it really makes me sad when, when somebody gets hit by that, you know, with, with the vulnerability that, that we've corrected. This illustrates the problem. These are websites penetrated by hackers in just two weeks last November, when Microsoft itself made the list. A Dutch hacker named Dimitri the software giant on their own website, and while he's keeping a low profile these days, he permitted an intermediary to explain for us just how he broke into Microsoft's computers. It was through a software glitch, a glitch for which the company had invented a patch, but somehow forgot to use on itself. Dimitri's friend, Jerry Mansur, explained how the hacker actually alerted Microsoft to its problem after his first break-in. When they failed to correct the situation, he decided to teach them a lesson. After he uh, compromised one server, he uh, told Microsoft in, uh, after some weeks, he found another server where he can get in. And it's uh, really strange because if you are compromised one time, you probably are going to look at your security. Microsoft didn't do that. And after a week, he could get in again. Jerry claims they broke in through Microsoft's newest software package, the Windows 2000 operating system, a system designed with an unprecedented emphasis on security. Security was a showstopper issue for that product. If there was a uh, security vulnerability that was discovered in the product, uh, the development team 
stopped ship or delayed ship until they had resolved that issue. Okay. Richard Power of the Computer Security Institute is skeptical about the talk of show-stopping security. I mean, how comforted can we be by, by the reassurances that we're getting from them now? Well, that's a loaded question. In one sense, you know, uh, Windows NT came out a few years ago. It was heralded as a secure operating system. And the hackers had a few good whacks at that tree, and, and fruit started falling off it right away. And now there's hundreds of vulnerabilities for NT. In fact, the hackers joke among themselves. They say NT stands for nice try. As if Microsoft hadn't suffered enough, thanks to Dimitri, Jerry Mansour himself launched an attack on some major American financial sites, including the NASDAQ Stock Exchange, CBSMarketWatch.com, BigCharts.com. He could have done a lot of damage, like altering share prices, but he just wanted to make a point that breaking in was easy. It uh, took only five minutes to break in uh, all three of the sites. And how did he get into them? With a known bug in uh, Microsoft uh, NT for Windows 2000. Instead of making mischief, he tipped off his targets about the potentially costly loophole in security. I sent it to all companies within 10 minutes a mail, explaining what I did, how I did it, and uh, how they can prevent it. Driven by its convenience and a lot of high energy promotion, internet commerce has bloomed into an economy worth trillions of dollars. But companies and customers are only starting to discover how vulnerable e-commerce really is. How some smart 15-year-old with a computer can knock it for a loop. Which is exactly what happened last winter when a 15-year-old from Montreal, calling himself Mafia Boy, launched the worst hacking attack yet. Giant auction site eBay was knocked out, then Buy.com and Amazon. Using basic hacking tools, he took control of an army of computers, then directed them to attack other computers at target locations with millions of messages, causing them to crash. Mafia Boy got busted by the Canadian Mounties and the FBI for cyber vandalism. But what's to stop the real Mafia from doing the same thing for profit? Nothing, says the FBI's Michael Vattis. But we're also seeing uh, a big spike in the number of cases involving organized criminal groups who are in it for uh, illicit financial gain. And the problem may well be worse than even the FBI realizes. Richard Power suspects that many cyber crimes go unreported because victims don't want to admit their weaknesses. There are all kinds of reasons that they want to keep it quiet. When there's, when there's blood in the water, the, the sharks get excited. And there's all kinds of sharks, not just hackers, civil liability lawyers, government regulators, uh, stockholders, uh, hostile takeover. People are looking at your company for hostile takeover. There's all kinds of reasons not to draw attention to uh, your vulnerabilities in cyberspace. This is clearly an underreported crime. There's no doubt about that. But I think there are a lot of reasons for that. First of all, I'm not sure that these crimes are, are always or even frequently detected. That's a harder technological problem than it seems. And there's no doubt that some victims are concerned about competitive disadvantage. Inevitably, corporate America turns to its own resources to combat a growing problem marshalling computer power and more traditional assets like spies and double agents to bring order to the newest wild frontier, cyberspace. James Adams, CEO of iDefense, believes it's a job too large and too complex for government. His company may well be a prototype, a private intelligence agency for cyberspace. You and I can go into our local computer store and buy what is essentially an immensely powerful and unlike, uh, which is the computer, and you can load that weapon with very powerful uh, bullets, which are hacks downloaded from the web, and you can fire that weapon at pretty much anybody you choose. Now, it's you and I going into the store that, ha that is be buying the latest technology. Historically, it's been governments that have invested in some new gizmo or other, 
that has taken 20 years to get into service that has had the, uh, the access and the control of that technology. Now you and I have control. That's a huge shift. And it's a, it's a shift that governments are ill-equipped to deal with. The federal government is even ill-equipped to protect itself from hackers. In a recent study by the General Accounting Office, 24 major agencies had significant lapses in computer security. By significant, we mean that we could get in, alter, delete, create, destroy, you know, modify information or systems. You've signed an official document. You're an official at an agency. I go inside, take the electronic version of it, modify it, put it back in the exact same place it was in the system before. Nobody knows it, and now they're operating as though that was the official, you know, memorandum that came out from you when it didn't. His job is penetrating America's most sensitive computers, and it's frighteningly easy. We're always successful. Even the U.S. Army is feeling insecure these days, adjusting to new security challenges. Remember Mafia Boy's attack on e-commerce? The Army's Computer Crime Investigation Unit is currently tracking a similar attempt to hijack some military computers for another attack, known in the jargon as a distributed denial of service. Special Agent James Smith explains just how the unidentified hacker planned to launch his blitz using one of those readily available Trojan horse programs. It's very easy for the, uh, the hacker to set this up. A lot of it's automated. He can scan further vulnerabilities throughout the internet and try to find computers that he can load this Trojan program on. And by a keystroke, he could send a command and all those computers infected would send the attack. The army is a popular target for elite hackers. Some just for the thrill of trying, others with more sinister intentions. We've had about uh, two serious uh, compromises uh, that basically, if implemented or carried through, they could have brought the Army to a stop. Uh, my greatest fear is that the, the level of vulnerability uh, is still so high uh, that we are really open to uh, a devastating attack on a broad scale against the computer networks that run uh, vital systems. The International Space Station, by one estimate, it will have cost a hundred billion dollars by the time it's finished. A laboratory with a mind-boggling assembly of electronic systems, all controlled by 52 computers. 250 miles below, in a quiet Miami neighborhood, a 16-year-old hacker thought it would be cool to download NASA files, including the software that controls the physical environment on board the space station. Because he's a juvenile, we're concealing his identity. His hacker name is Comrade. He also broke into a national defense site that monitors serious security threats. It's power at your fingertips. You can control all these uh, computers from the government, from the military, from large corporations, and that's power. It's a power trip. I will. A Florida judge handed Comrade a six-month sentence of house arrest for his mischief, but he says the really bad hackers might not be as easy to catch as he was. I didn't, I didn't cover my tracks at all, and had I done that, uh, they, they would not have been able to catch me. If, if I wanted to, I could have hidden myself, but I didn't think I was doing anything wrong, so, so why bother? Um, you could have escaped detection. I could have. Of if course you, I could have. You could have done a lot of damage? If, if one was so inclined, they could have deleted files, they could have put a virus up, or they could have sold information to foreigners. Comrade, curador, mafia boy. Kids kicked out of cyberspace for misbehaving. But what does it really tell us? The juvenile hackers and the young hackers get caught. That they, and they end up in the headlines because they get caught. And uh, the reason they get caught is they're not professionals. They are out for the adventure. They are out for bragging rights. They are out for exploration. The professional, the ex-KGB agent or the ex-CIA agent, you know, or the person from German intelligence or Israeli intelligence, they're not going to get caught. There's nothing new about espionage. 
Even George Washington had to deal with spies and saboteurs, but the internet has made them a lot harder to catch. And so graduate students at George Washington University play a new kind of war game, an emergency response to a virtual crisis caused by a hostile hacker. FBI, Four Corners, Utah. At 0900 Pacific Time, the main electrical transformers at the four generator plants at Four Corners, Utah, suffered catastrophic failures. The Nikkei index dropped dramatically in the opening of trading on the 26th, triggering all... In the imaginary scenario, cyber terrorists have launched an international attack with targets including privately owned American utilities like power stations. Many of these students are military and political staffers. The leader is Jim Christie, a specialist in information warfare for the Department of Defense. For now, it's just a game, but the motivation is for real. We ran this scenario with uh, generals and admirals and then CEOs of major corporations. And everybody looks at the world from their own perspective, and they all had different perspectives. Uh, the military wanted to be action-oriented. They wanted to counterattack, but they didn't know who to counterattack. Uh, and and the, the civilian uh, uh, assistant secretaries, uh, they wanted to do something, but they weren't sure what to do or who to do it to. And the private sector folks kept saying, our infrastructure, we don't want federal government involved in our infrastructure. It's my infrastructure that's under attack. We don't want federal government in involvement. We'll take care of it. We'll handle it. It's ours. FBI, Leesburg, Virginia. The main computers at the Leesburg Air Traffic Control Center serving the mid-Atlantic region go down for two hours. The catastrophic results of a serious web attack are, in this case, just projections, but they are based on real calculations by the military using real services that are vital in the daily lives of Americans. As the, the Pentagon uh, a little while ago demonstrated in an exercise that they ran, it was possible easy, actually, to hack into the power grids of uh, the 12 largest American cities and to hack into the 911, the emergency system, and shut all of those off with a click of a button. The director of the FBI reported to the president that the Manhattan telephone switches and the Federal Reserve Clearinghouse had been disabled by electronic pulse bombs. I think every one of the individual scenarios uh, could happen. How do we respond? Uh, a new generation of Americans prepare for leadership roles in a new kind of conflict, facing a phantom enemy, maybe just a disaffected teenager, maybe a terrorist. Because you may never prove who it is. You've got uh, vandals, you've got organized crime, you've got uh, extensive economic espionage, you've got 30 nation states with very aggressive offensive information warfare programs. India is a whole new uh, player in this game. And China, they have recognized in their own documentation that they cannot match the United States um, in a conventional way. They'll never be able to beat the US in armored personnel carriers, tanks, missiles, guns, and so on. But that they can do a great deal with information warfare because they recognize how vulnerable the US is and what they can do by setting up the right techniques and mechanisms which eventually could make terrorism, like the suicide attack on USS Cole in Yemen last October, less risky for the terrorists. Countries and traditional terrorist organizations have not really adopted this doctrine yet. So their leadership didn't grow up with this technology, so they're going to you know, blow things up with uh, uh, C4 still. Uh, when, they, when, when the new generation of leadership in terrorist organizations and nation states uh, uh, move into positions uh, where they can affect things, I think you'll we'll find that that's going to eventually happen to us. Jim Christie believes it's inevitable. Uh, absolutely. I mean, anonymity is built into the process. You, you, you don't have to sacrifice like, uh, like they did in Yemen. You don't have to sacrifice two individuals. Uh, you can do it remotely. Uh, and maybe do the same, same, have the same effect. Now it gets real. At 1800, an emergency video conference, the CIA and the FBI were told by the National Security Advisor that the president wanted them to increase their level of cooperation to whatever was needed to respond to the escalating domestic and international crisis. Recent efforts to penetrate Japanese infrastructure control and information systems were the work of sophisticated, malevolent actors. <laughs> It was the sort of terrorist act security experts have nightmares about. 
1995, it was still too early to link a terrorist attack like the sarin gas attack on the Tokyo subway system by a cult to information warfare. But five years later, the connection has become all too clear. They were actively engaged in hacking into Japanese corporations and other entities around the world to gain technology they wanted, laser technology, for instance, because they wanted to build their own laser guns. And they, in fact, targeted in their recruiting software engineers and scientists and bright young people who had skills that they wanted. The cult is called Aum Shinri Kyo, a sophisticated doomsday sect with a ministry of intelligence dedicated to stealing high-tech secrets from American and Japanese corporations and research institutions. It turns out that a front organization, which is controlled by the Ohm cult, was the contractor that developed software for, the Jap for 90 Japanese government agencies, including the Japanese police and elements of the Japanese Defense Department. And a day, literally a day before this software was to be deployed, somebody put two and two together and blew the whistle and said, wait a minute, you know, look who developed this software. One such lapse could lead to chaos, and as the war games in Washington conclude, talk of chaos soon leads to talk of martial law. As far as cyber attacks go, I mean, martial law is very good for keeping people off the streets. The problem is they're going to be in their bedrooms with the computers clicking and doing more attacks, so I'm not seeing that martial law is going to be extremely effective. I'm not understanding how martial law is going to contribute to any heightened computer security. If you've got these domestic terrorist groups, who knows what they'll be doing. They could be blowing up trains in a couple days. They could be sabotaging water supplies. Who knows? So I think it would be definitely justified to declare martial law, shut down everything, and deal with the problem. You said you're going to turn off the internet. Let's shut it down. Let's shut everybody out. Are you going to have planes flying? We haven't even gotten into that. We are at war. We don't know who we're at war with yet. But we are at, we're at war, and we're going to use everything at our disposal, and we're going to, you know, I don't know. The point of all of this is we're redefining war. Information technology redefining war, prosperity, and peace, perhaps even freedom, by provoking new demands for government controls. We have to protect critical infrastructures, and that is essentially a three-part solution. Part one is the government has to legislate what comprises due diligence. Software has to meet certain standards of safety and stability and reliability and transparency. The second part is that government has to test and certify that software so that as a commonwealth interest, software is validated by the government as meeting those standards. But the third and most important part is that the proprietors of the computers themselves must live up to a new standard of responsibility. You can't leave your computer connected to the world and not have firewalls. You can't send documents without encryption or other protection and expect them to remain private. So we ourselves have a responsibility. But our responsibility, although the most important, is only the third step. The first two steps have to be taken by government and by the private sector. We want this internet, this global cyberspace, to be completely free completely open. Everyone does. I do. But we also want to conduct business there. And we want to relax there and have our children be educated there and, and seek entertainment there. Those kinds of activities require law enforcement, require international treaties, require responsibility, corporate responsibility, and personal responsibility. So we have a long way to go before cyberspace is as safe even as the highways. And as you know, the highways aren't all that safe. Infrastructure, services we take for granted, essentially insecure, and will stay like that until security catches up with technology. Computer security is very expensive, costs a lot of money, and it requires a lot of technically skilled people. And as you know, we're all, government and industry, competing for those same folks. It's, it's hard for government to have enough people to really secure networks. 
Finding the people to secure networks might not be as difficult as the bureaucrats believe. In Las Vegas in July last year, there were 6,000 possibilities at the 8th annual DEF CON convention, the premier event on any hacker's calendar. The crowd includes headhunters from industry and government, including the CIA. It's a place to network, test new technology, and test each other. We override our Last year, a group called Ghetto Hackers from Seattle won the major competition in Las Vegas. The star of the collective calls himself Caesar. It takes a certain kind of a mind to try and break things all day. It, it takes a certain kind of a person, and I think that kind of attracts a counterculture mentality. And that's why you're seeing a lot of the news press releases in the security industry these days talk about the company's policy toward hackers. You know, we hire hackers, we don't hire hackers. Well, they all do. Can you give me some water? Can we get the coffee going, too? The social highlight at each convention is an unusual sort of party hosted by Caesar and his group. It's an invitation-only affair. We've got about 100 people coming uh, to this party, um, maybe 200. They're special because they're uh, government agents that are uh, interested in what we have to know, and they're going to be some uh, very elite hackers from all over the world who are very interested in what the government has to know. And we're providing a forum for them to uh, interact privately and without uh, any interference from their reputations or from the public or, or anything, and uh, let them creatively solve some really difficult problems. Because only could attend, they kicked us out early. By all accounts, we didn't miss much fun. It was mostly about advanced mathematics and mind-numbing computer codes. It went on all night. Even when Caesar let us back in and explained what they'd done, it didn't make a lot of sense though he assures us that buried in the hieroglyphics there are predictions of the future. Predictions of new problems and hopefully solutions. I guess it's something more like a, a hurricane predictor than actually causing the hurricane. Um, and that, that's sort of an important idea is that these things uh, will happen on their own. Uh, we just try to give the public a little heads up warning, trying to come up with how these sorts of things might happen. Hackers have come of age. I clearly see that government and industry understand that hackers and the views that hackers represent are a force to be reckoned with. And therefore, over the next five to ten years, I anticipate that hackers will have a very beneficial influence on the safety and stability of cyberspace. The safety and stability of cyberspace will ultimately depend on the people who know most about the dangers and perhaps most of all, on people who helped define the dangers in the first place.